You know, Aki, when I was uh, looking over the annual report uh, this year, uh, one of the things that struck me was the incredible impact we continue to have. And then uh, to have that quantified by that ACR study, where they were able to calculate that for every year from 1985 to 2009, Erie rice varieties added $1.46 billion per year of value to uh, Vietnam, Philippines, and Indonesia. I mean, that kind of uh, impact is just staggering. You know, it's more than one year of that impact is more than the total that's been invested in Erie. And so when we think of, of the nature of the impact that we have, I think uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's just mind-boggling. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, the returns on investment on, on germ plasm improvement research are great. And uh, certainly we've demonstrated in the past uh, that kind of level of impact. I guess what uh, interests me nowadays is uh, how are we going to continue that? Can we just continue breeding doing in the same way? Uh, we'll have the same impact uh, now. What needs to be changed? And I think in 2011 we started thinking a lot in a different direction. How can we go towards a more market-oriented breeding where we can have more precisely defined different environments, the market segments, the consumers that will eat the different kind of rice and what does that mean also in terms of rice quality requirements and how we reorganize our breeding programs. I think that's been one of the new developments that uh, even a public sector breeding institution like Erie with its partners in the national program now needs to start thinking about it all. Yeah, and I think it's no, no coincidence that we're here in the Rice Grain Quality and Nutrition Laboratory at Erie. Uh, you know, recognizing that rice trade is going to be more and more international, recognizing that uh, quality requirements are at the same time diverse as well as demanding, uh, forces any breeding program that wants to remain relevant into uh, understanding what actually makes up acceptable and desirable rice grain quality, uh, what the market demands, what consumers want, what they're willing to pay for, all of which translates into making a much more robust rice economy, and one uh, from which rice farmers, instead of being trapped in poverty, can begin to extract some real value. Uh, and I think this, this creation of value is, is a, a very important part of a modern, modern breeding program. Yeah, I'm really excited about this because, I mean, we've thought in the past always about, you know, rice as something that needs to be cheap. You know, of course, people who depend on rice at their staple food want affordable rice, yeah, but we also see in recent years that increasingly people in the, also the Asian countries want a much more diverse range of rice. If I go outside of Erie and do the local supermarket here, I can buy nowadays 10, 15 different kinds of rice uh, packaged in different ways. And 10 years ago that would have been only a few. Quirky things about uh, rice grain quality that's, that's always struck me is uh, how incredibly picky rice eaters can be about the way the grain looks. Uh, unlike wheat, or which you grind up into a powder and then mix it up with water and cook, throw it in the oven and cook it, uh, rice is eaten as a whole grain. And so the way it appears, even before it's cooked, can be extremely important to a consumer. And so our breeders not only have to worry about all the things like yield and disease resistance, etc. They got to worry about what the grain looks like and what is a beautiful grain to one person might be absolutely atrocious looking to another. Uh, so we spend quite a bit of effort trying to uh, sort out uh, how to figure out what makes the rice look like. I'm actually quite excited uh, because uh, when we look at how Erie has developed in recent years, just a simple statistic of the kind like we had last year in 2011. Uh, every month uh, we fired 15 new pieces in the organization or even more. Yeah. And it's been really a sign of growing but also rejuvenating in, in new people with new ideas and new skills. Yeah. We've also had an increasing number of uh, women on the scientific career uh, track. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that there's, uh, I think, uh, 
the new generation also of young people out there, hopefully, who will now have an increasing interest in agricultural science and come to places like Yuri and work with us and our partners in the future. Yeah, we, we had a, almost maybe a, a record number of, of retirements from the Institute, uh, yeah. the overwhelming number of them actually reaching retirement age. And on the one hand, uh, one, at my level and your level, one worries a little bit about, you know, we losing a lot of institutional memory, critical mass, etc. On the other hand, we're bringing in a whole new cohort yeah. of, of new or early and mid-career scientists that will really energize uh, the institution. You can see that already in terms of the number of postdocs we have, the number of graduate students we have. Uh, not forgetting that URI was founded as an education and research institution. And I think that now keeping a good balance between that educational component and the research component uh, demands that we have a young and dynamic staff, uh, along with a few gray beards, if I would, but uh, you know, keep the balance right so that, that we've got enough young and hungry scientists who challenge us and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, older scientists who have the memory of who can come back and say, well, actually we tried that 15 years ago and this is what we found, and this is why it did or didn't work. Show me where we were wrong. And getting into that kind of dynamic is critically important for uh, maintaining the health of an, of an institution like yours. Yeah, when I, late last year, started thinking about well, what would 2012 be like, you know, looking ahead. And I concluded at the end that, well, it would been We've been through a process of quite a few years now of planning and changing, and mm -hmm. prioritizing and starting new things. So for me, 2012 year is going to be the year of going back to work. You know. Now it's time to really do the things, give people enough uh, freedom and hopefully also resources to do it. And I'm 100% convinced that uh, they will come up with many, many interesting new things. And not to our benefit, but to the benefit of the farmers and many other stakeholders that we work with. I think, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, what we have been achieving over the last couple of years and are so brilliantly highlighted uh, in this year's annual report and last year's annual report as well, are achievements that when you and I were around the rice world 10, 15 years ago, People said it either were impossible yeah. or would not happen within our lifetimes. And now we're seeing them not only coming out as experimental results, we're seeing them in the farmers' fields. 1.2 million farmers in India alone growing flood tolerant rice. Yeah. And we have flood tolerance now combining with drought tolerance. When I joined Erie in 1992, I was laughed out of the room when we suggested <laughs> we could combine drought tolerance and flood tolerance. They said, we don't even have drought and flood tolerance. How can you think of yeah. combining them with anything? So, so no. it's, it's an exciting time. It's, and it's going to be another good year. Ahead.